Hey, welcome back everybody. Sitting here, Jeff and I are filming this episode from two different places, but we have a live interview process coming to you from Gas World, the CO2 Summit. And real quick before we dive into that, we just want to recap our thoughts. Uh, so, so Jeff and I are going to touch a little bit on what we saw at the show. It was a fantastic show, a really healthy mix of attendees, 250 delegates. We had suppliers, we had end users, we had equipment manufacturers, and everybody in between all trying to understand what's going on with the CO2 market, how can we get ahead, uh, and how do we start to mitigate some of the pains that we're feeling in the short term and also proactively for the long term. Yeah, yeah. So, so coming off a, a, a long week at uh, the the CO2 summit there in Chicago, put on by Gas World, Hannah, Johnny, and Gas World team did an outstanding job as they always did, and as Luke just mentioned, uh, a great collection of of you know suppliers and and uh, users and distributors and and new technologies. Uh, so yeah, as Luke said, we're going to interview a few people at the show and just get some feedback on there. And we'll get a little bit deeper into it into the next episode uh, as to you know all the things that we we talked about. But we just want to kind of cover a quick little takeaways and and just let it uh, move over to to uh, the people that we interviewed. But uh, yeah, the biggest takeaway for me, Luke, was uh, I don't know if you felt the same way, but um, I still didn't sense enough fear. I sensed a lot of pain. Uh, you know, there was a lot of short term fear and short term pains and what are we going to do about this and how do we solve this problem uh, and you heard some great long term solutions of biogas and other technologies and recoveries and all that great thing but there was uh, not enough conversation I don't think about 45Q and sequestration really what that means not today but as we always say two three four five years from now where is this market going and if we don't start getting shovels in the ground today uh, the the long term impact for everybody in attendance at this show is going to be far greater than what we're seeing right now because I do think that this will subside the pain right now will subside by December or January when when Hopewell opens back up when Augusta opens back up and the contamination issues of the dome are gone we'll forget about it for a short amount of time maybe a year but then we're going to be right back where we started and we didn't hear enough about that I didn't think other than that I thought it was an outstanding event. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, you know, there were there were people there that were kind of just getting their feet wet, dipping their toes into 45Q and not a lot of presentation on that. But as you're saying, if we start to constrict supply because sequestration really takes a grip, uh, you know, we're we're 15 months, we're two years out from building the infrastructure to start to use these new sources. And so, yes, we heard a ton about biogas and everybody's saying we're going to adopt sources and, and there will be buy in from end users. And this is what it's going to take. But to bring that online, I mean, the infrastructure, we're a ways out. And, and so you're exactly right. I mean, the sense of urgency certainly needs to pick up. I, mean, I think you did a fantastic job on your presentation. Uh, and I'll let you touch on that here before we dive into the interviews. But yeah, we're definitely going to bring next week's episode uh, a recap of what Jeff talked about. He did really uh, get people thinking, I think, to close out the session at the CO2 Summit. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, no. So I, I think the uh, the interviews speak for themselves, and you know, one of the things I want to touch on before we get into the interviews is uh, alternatives. Is one of the conversations that pops up, and, and we've talked about it. You know, we're we're gas agnostic. If you can use nitrogen instead of CO two, where you have no CO two, uh, that we'd encourage that. But I also look at the long term of, of nitrogen as well. Is nitrogen a viable substitute for dry, uh, for CO two, where you can food freezing and some other applications? The answer is yes today, but you know, air separation plants use a tremendous amount of energy and sooner or later, sooner or later, are we going to say, you know, we, we have blue and green hydrogen now, uh, we have, we have uh, blue ammonia and to be blue you have to capture the CO2 that you produce using the energy uh, and, or, and or use solar or wind power generated energy. Uh, it, are we going to mandate that for nitrogen too, oxygen, argon, things like that? If that's the case, now the cost and expense and the availability of those gases start to diminish. So. Uh, we hear a lot of great things in these interviews, and uh, you get a real sense of kind of what we're saying, the, you know, the touch the pulse of, of what people are feeling today. Now, we got how do we keep that, uh, that uh, um, momentum and take that into the future? And so that's keep listening to this podcast because we're going to continue to talk about these things. Look forward to kind of recapping the show and, and my presentation and our, our thoughts in, in broader scale next week. But uh, for now, take it over to these uh, great interviews. Thanks, Luke. Yep. Enjoy the interview. Thank you, Jeff.
What's going on, everybody? We are coming to you live from the CO2 Summit in Chicago, put on by Gas World. And today, in between sessions, we are going to be talking to some of the attendees uh, and asking them a few questions, Q&A style, understanding what the pain point has been for them, for their customers, and what they are doing to be on the proactive. Just me today, because Jeff is presenting. He's closing down the session this afternoon. And so he cannot be bothered because he's so focused. But that's okay, because I'm going to take it home. I think we're going to have producer Lily do a few interviews as well. So you get to see a new face. We're going to talk to a lot of different people, get a few opinions. Once again, thank you gas world for putting on this awesome event and episode eight, you're going to get to hear from a number of different people. Super excited to bring in this episode. Hey guys, we're here with Josh Pringle from CO2 meter and he's the executive vice president. I have a question. So Good. what with the state of the market, the way it is, it's rough. It is. Yeah. So what are you guys doing to alleviate these pains? They don't really affect us per se, but they're affecting our customers. So we're hearing all the different machinations of what people are going through, all the trials and tribulations. Some people handle it differently than others. Um, I think everybody's just sort of scrambling in the market and try to figure out what's going on. But it's still, I mean, I call it CO2 Armageddon, and I think we're going to be that way for a while. Thank you. I'm with Jordan Pattonaud of Kraft Heinz. JP said that she has got quite the answer for us. So we are wondering, you're in procurement with Kraft Heinz. What challenges are you all seeing with CO2 and what are you doing to mitigate them and to kind of get ahead? Okay, um, so challenges. We purchase quite a bit of CO2 across the country and I think that is your first challenge is you've got regional suppliers, regional markets, and everyone's in a different scenario with their market. So that would be our biggest challenge to start. And then as we continue down the supply chain and we start to look at across the region, we have a lot of scenarios where we can find gas, but we can't find the trucks. We can find the trucks, but we can't find the gas. And then you have the contamination issues. So as a food processor, you know, we also have to make sure we're protecting our customers with the food that we sell. Um, so having the right quality gas is always top of mind. Um, and there's just not enough supply, period. From a mitigation standpoint, this is a huge reason why we're here today. Um, we're learning as much as we can about the CO2 market right now. Um, and I think we're looking at anything and everything we can from a short term perspective as well as longer term. Uh, so short term, different trucking solutions, different solutions with tankers, different solutions with storage um, and alternate suppliers. So how do we look tap more into our distributor network? How do we tap in more to the majors um, and find the right partnerships longer term? And then we would also be looking at conversion. So in the areas and circumstances we cannot use CO2, we can't convert, but in the areas where we can, we are converting to nitrogen. Um, so that's both a short-term investment as well as a long-term investment we're making. Well, I think we've got all the right minds here today and good to see y'all being proactive. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I'm here with Sean Schulte from Emory Dry Ice. We're looking at recovery units to recover every molecule that we can to prolong the CO2 that we actually are purchasing, getting more molecules into our system right. without having to spend more money. Okay. Here with Fabian Van Damme, or <laughs> Van Damme as we say <laughs> here in America. Fabian is the founder of Domeyer and Fabian, excited to have you here. We're wondering, what is your biggest problem been with CO2 and what are you all doing to combat against that? Yeah, so we are, um, we are very blessed that over the last 10 years we had this type of crises in Europe already and um, we have developed systems that were both on CO2 and nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So that means that we, uh, we have the know-how to convert and help converting our customers from CO2 to nitrogen systems and for pretty much a lot of applications we have an alternative. Yeah, that's awesome. Well thank you for that and Please. awesome to see you guys being proactive. Hey, I'm with Stephen Farrell, Executive Vice President of Ally Energy Solutions. And Stephen, good to be with you today. Absolutely. What's going on? What are you guys seeing for CO2? What are your pain points and what are you doing about it? So effectively, having our understanding of the changing CO2 market and how it's going to be delivered to end clients and the pricing changes that are going to occur with the 45Q incentives, getting our clients to understand that things are changing rapidly. If we can, resol if we can resolve the resiliency through on-site production or regional distribution hubs, which we have all of the uh, line of sight to solving those problems, getting them to understand that let's go this direction and we can do this together. Ally Energy Solutions is focused on the client first, technology agnostic, 
but we've been in the business for over almost 10 years now and in the RNG space, energy efficiency space, and all of our clients use CO2. And we just want to advance the solutions for them. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much for coming. Have a good show. You got it, man. Well, we've packed up. The conference is winding down, and Jeff just got everybody electrified with his presentation. It was awesome to listen to, and hopefully we will find a way to bring that to you all. Uh, but we will be touching on everything he discussed right here on this podcast. It was great to talk to a variety of different people today, from suppliers to end users and everybody in between. Um, and, and it's just so clear that CO2 maybe an afterthought in the past is now on the forefront of everybody's minds we hope you enjoyed this episode and we've met a lot of people here today that are going to be coming on guests on the podcast we're going to continue to dive deeper from the co2 summit thank you gas world we had a blast and we will see you guys for the next episode take care